Prior to Europeans' arrival, most indigenous tribes in the Northeast lived in agricultural communities with strong social and cultural traditions. Among the first to have extended contact with Europeans, these native people generally fell under two main groups, Iroquoian and Algonquian speakers. Algonquian-speaking tribes lived primarily along the coast in stable fishing and farming villages, while the more warlike Iroquoian-speaking tribes lived inland in smaller hamlets near rivers and lakes and relied on hunting. Native Americans in this area practiced subsistence farming, which is farming that provided enough to survive but did not serve as a source of income. During winter, the coastal tribes lived within the protection of forests but moved closer to the coast during warmer seasons to take advantage of the arable land. They also hunted birds and wild game, including deer and moose, whose pelts were used for clothing. Although conflict among the tribes was not unknown, prior to the arrival of Europeans, cultural traditions such as songs, stories, dances, and ceremonies among allied villages and hamlets formed richly complex social networks that flourished. Native American tribes in the Northeast had developed a democratic system of governance that emphasized cooperation. Decisions were made by communal agreement, which included the input of women. Indeed, Native American women exercised more authority and autonomy than their English counterparts. Women were responsible for the internal management and welfare of the community. They owned the family property, they raised the children, and planted, harvested, gathered, and prepared foodstuffs. Their importance to the community and maternal authority gave them political and economic clout, a power as yet unrealized by European women. Colonization forced changes in the lives of native people and sparked two major conflicts with Europeans. The Pequot War, 1636, and King Philip's War, 1675. European colonists brought new ideas to the West, Perhaps the most troublesome of these was the concept of land ownership. Europeans equated land ownership to wealth and saw the New World as offering limitless possibilities. Native tribes, however, believed that land could not be possessed by an individual any more than the air. Thus, when Native Americans first shared the land with settlers, they did not understand that the settlers would now consider that land their property and would bar anyone else from using it. Also, even though Europeans had come to the New World seeking religious freedom, they refused to tolerate native spirituality, and native people had little interest in Christianity. Finally, their systems of governance differed, with common language binding tribes together in a collection of politically and culturally distinct bands, while Europeans tended to operate under central governments. Despite these major differences, the two groups now had to negotiate terms for living together in peace. While these circumstances were difficult enough, disease was added to the mix. Native people had no immunity to many old world diseases such as smallpox, and entire tribes died of illness. Over time, tensions mounted between the two groups, resulting in two all-out wars, the Pequot War and King Philip's War. When the English colonists landed in New England, the coastal Algonquian tribes generally welcomed them. Massasoit, the grand sachem, or intertribal chief of the Wampanoag people, maintained peace between his people and the settlers for 50 years. In contrast, another Algonquian tribe, the Pequots, came to resent European intrusions into their territory and encroachments on the fur trade. The Pequot saw the colonists as invaders to be repelled. Pequot killings of English traders in 1634 and 1636 ultimately sparked a bloody 11-month conflict called the Pequot War. Thousands engaged in battle, with the two sides well-matched in military force and tactics. Nevertheless, by September 1637, the Pequot War ended in victory for the colonists. Some 500 to 600 Pequots had died, including women and children, and the survivors scattered. The colonists caught and killed some survivors while selling others into slavery. The general peace that ensued would last until King Philip's War in 1675. The destruction of the Pequots shifted the balance of power in the region, making New England tribes keenly aware of the colonists' willingness to engage in ferocious, all-out war. 
For several decades, the tribes endured further encroachment on their land, the overhunting of game, and a general disregard for their rights and cultural heritage. They were compelled to sign treaties that weakened their power, and some tribes were subjected to forced labor. Growing resentment and smoldering anger simply waited for a fatal spark. That spark would come in 1675. Among the native people were converts to Christianity, referred to as praying Indians. Some praying Indians became spies for the English. One such native convert, John Sassaman, served as an interpreter for Medicom, now the grand sachem of the Wampanoag Confederacy, whom the English also called King Philip in honor of his high rank. Sassaman told the colonists in Plymouth that he believed King Philip was preparing for war against the English, and King Philip ordered his execution for this betrayal. The English responded by convicting three of Philip's warriors for Sassaman's murder and executing them in Plymouth. Fearing that he too would be tried and in protection of Wampanoag sovereignty, King Philip launched a war at once. Regional Indian forces joined King Philip's forces in a fierce 14 month long conflict that began in June 1675 and ended with Philip's death in August 1676. Despite terrible losses on both sides, the colonists emerged victorious and even more entrenched in the New World. With the Northeastern tribes decimated by war and disease, opposition to Europeans' presence in the Northeast had all but disappeared.